Biography in Sound. Mr. Allen! Mr. Allen! The National Broadcasting Company presents transcribed A Portrait of Fred Allen. There's only one chaplain, one Buster Keaton, one W.C. Fields, and there was only one Fred Allen. He liked to say something, and that was the, the thing I admired most about him. His jokes poked fun at somebody that needed it. Although uh, caustic at times, never at anyone's expense. He was never cruel. He was always tender and thinking of his fellow man. The way he talked, the way he think, the way he feel toward people, I have a great respect on him. So I thought he was such a wonderful human being. Good man, shows such good example in our society. His wit and humor came right out of him just like water out of a faucet. As he once said to me, I never want to get used to anything I may ever have to do without. Now, if he's sitting on his own special cloud, he's probably giving everybody up there a wonderful time. Alan Fred, born in Boston, and at my birth, a strange thing happened. The doctor slapped me after I started crying. <laughs> my first brush with a critic. My parents immediately started me in show business by taking an ad in Variety, announcing my arrival. Fred Allen has diaper, will travel. <laughs> I travel to the three corners of the earth. Since then, there have been many changes. I'm not referring to the diaper. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our narrator, Jack Haley. No part of the thumbnail autobiography you've just heard is true. Actually, John Florence Sullivan was born in Cambridge. His father was a bookbinder in the Boston Public Library, and there, too, Fred found work as a stack boy while still attending public school in Cambridge. The pay wasn't anything to brag about, 25 cents an hour. The most important is the fact that one day in the stacks, Fred found a book on juggling. Fred began to practice juggling with cigar boxes, rubber balls, and oranges, and while still a youngster, was appearing on amateur nights in the local vaudeville houses. Benny Drone, then a professional vaudevillian, recalls Fred as a youngster. He was a, sort of a pimply-faced kid, very thin, always looked undernourished. I guess he was. He was fatherless and motherless, a couple of maiden aunts raised him. While still in his teens, Fred appeared as an amateur juggler, wherever he could find a stage to work on and an audience to play to. Whenever he could, Fred returned to Boston University to study, but most of the time he was on the road. He was not a good juggler, and once, when someone in the audience heckled him about it, he replied with a spontaneously funny remark that was far more entertaining than his juggling. As time passed, his juggling became merely an excuse for his coming on stage. What kept him there and what kept the audience with him was his dry, witty patter. I had a room that was so small, it had removable doorknobs. If you wanted to bend over in your room, you could take off the doorknob just in case. <laughs> there, at Mrs. Brown's, when you took a bath, you had to keep singing. There was no lock on the bathroom door. <laughs> Bill is the world's worst juggler. Fred played in vaudeville houses all over the country. It was on a booking abroad that Fred met his devoted friend, Uncle Jim Hawkins. We were in Australia together in 1915, and he was playing over there one circuit, and I was playing with my wife on another circuit. And that was when he was a kid, you know, struggling. But even in those days, he was so far ahead of us who had five, six, eight, ten years on him in the comedy department and everything else. He was way ahead of us. And uh, nobody helped Fred Allen but Fred Allen. Don't ever let anybody tell you that they helped him because that marvelous creative mind of his is what did everything. While he was in Australia, Fred's path crossed with that of his old friend, Doc Rockwell. The people are there very provincial and they looked on these American actors... Uh, we wore different clothes, and they'd run down the streets hoo-hooing and laughing and booing in the theaters. And uh, the ordeal, until you finally got through and out of there, was terrific. And Fred had quite a, uh, a little device to annoy the people in the hotels, the hotel proprietors. He 
made out of uh, rubber, little sheets of rubber. He cut small little things that looked like uh, footprints and made little rubber stamps out of them. And in the hotel, going from the lavatory, the wash bowl, to the bathtub, he would have these little series of footprints that would come out and go over as if they had disappeared down the drain. The life of a vaudevillian was never an easy one, but for Fred, it was especially hard for a very special reason. Uncle Jim Hawkins. Fred was canceled, not because he didn't do a good act, but because he wasn't understood. The manager would call up and say, I hate to cancel this kid. I laughed like the Dickens. The musicians laughed, the stagehands laughed, but our audience didn't know what he was doing, you see? And as I say, in those days, we'd say to... Uh, say to him, say, look, why don't you uh, try this? You know, you hate to see a kid canceled so many times. You say, w why don't you take some old gags and dish them off a plate, you know, and let the audience in on some of it so they can get a few. He says, no, there must be some intelligent people in this world, and I'm going to hew to that line until I find them. Now, this, these are days when it took a lot of courage to do that, because don't forget, they were hungry days. They were short dollar days. Fred was born John Florence Sullivan. In vaudeville, he was known variously as Paul Huckle, Fred St. James, and Freddie James. How he became known as Fred Allen is told by Benny Drone. He was up in a booking office. A fellow by the name of Edgar Allen used to book the uh, Fox Circuit around New York. And he was looking for work, and the guy says, what do you do? He says, I juggle. He says, go right down to the 14th Street Theater, the Fox Theater down there. And get your stuff down there, and you'll be able to go on for the rest of uh, the day, and uh, it's a split week. You'll get the three days' pay. So after he left, the man at the theater called up and said, What's this fellow's name is sending down? Because we'd like to put his name out with the rest of the vaudeville bill in front of the theater. And this fellow, Edgar Allen, said, His name is Edgar Allen. And the fellow on the other side thought he said Fred Allen, so out went Fred Allen, and from then on he was known as Fred Allen. Fred made his Broadway bow in the passing show of 1922. Later he appeared in Greenwich Village Follies, Three's a Crowd, and The Little Show. Appearing with him in The Little Show were Libby Holman and Clifton Webb. The first time I ever met Fred was on the stage of the Music Box Theater. We were called there for a reading of the various sketches. And from the moment I met him, I realized that this was a very generous, sympathetic, wonderful man. We'd played the show for a year in New York, and Fred became a great, great success. Perhaps one reason for Fred's success is that he was always dedicated to his work. He was an actor of the old school, you know, a comedian with a fine intellect. George Jessel. His talents would have stood up in the days of Raymond Hitchcock, Nat Goodwin, Willie Collier, and Julius Tannen on the stage. And the lecture halls, he would have ably held his own with any Will Rogers, Peter Finley, Dunn, and all the other giants of a more literate age. And as I think of him now, I think that Fred would have been more appreciated in the days of swirling capes and low bows. Another longtime friend and admirer of Fred's is John Royal. While many actors were playing the horses or the nightclubs, Fred would be in his dressing room playing the typewriter one finger, either writing for himself or writing for some other artist not so well off who needed some material. He never became competitive uh, with people. Fred never kicked about billing. He never kicked about dressing rooms. All he wanted was a space in one where he could go out and work. Fred never was vicious. Fred found happiness in his work on the stage, but he found an even greater happiness in a person he met there. Fred and Portland were married on May 4th, 1927. It was an extraordinarily happy marriage. And this wonderful woman, she was a great inspiration to Fred, everything he did. Uncle Jim Hawkins. 
because he respected her so much. When he would write hour after hour and hour at any time in the morning, she was with him, always. All night when he'd be writing, and she would set the time for him to take the walks. When she'd say, that's enough, let's take a walk, he would drop everything. There was never any such thing as a squabble in that family, and there was no one ever as married as they were, because they were always together, everywhere, no matter where they went. He went nowhere without her, and the same with Portman. She never went anywhere without him. And if they walked down the street and holding hands, you know, it wasn't any silly holding hands. It was a beautiful bond between two people that the average person today with this crazy way of living doesn't understand.
1932, after a two-year run on the Little Show, Fred closed on Broadway. On October 23rd of that year, he appeared in his first radio show. This is Roger White, Fred Owl's producer, and he pays at the Limit Bath Club.
Asian than the average person. Probably the greatest pleasure is financial independence brought him, but it enabled him to help other people. He had a more green, we call it, an amusing account of Fred's generosity. Fred, for many years, of course, was the easiest touch on Broadway or anywhere else. Uh, if a man once played with him in a bill in Topeka, Kansas, he then suddenly considered Fred, 40 years later, to be his uncle, and uh, wrote him a letter saying, I need money, and Fred, of course, invariably would send it. And so there were many panhandlers around town, actual panhandlers, grifters who would attach themselves to Fred and meet up with him wherever he went around town. Fred was a tremendous walker, a great walker. And every Sunday, he used to go to Mass at St. Malachi's Church on uh, 49th Street. And there was one fellow around town whose name was The Whistler. And he discovered that Fred was going to Mass at 11 o'clock every Sunday. And so he stationed himself along the line of march on 49th Street, a few doors up from the church, in front of a ticket office, a Broadway ticket office. And uh, every Sunday when Fred would come by, he would say, Hello, Fred. And Fred would say, Hello, Whistler and hand him $2. This went on for a long time. As a matter of fact, it was at the time it became such a routine that the whistler got himself a little job in a ticket office running tickets for him. And one Sunday, uh, Fred showed up, and there was no whistler. And he looked into the ticket office, and one of the men from the ticket office came running out and said, Fred, oh, Mr. Allen. He said, yes. He says, uh, where's the whistler? And the man said, well, today was his birthday. So he took the day off. Would you give me two dollars for it? And Fred said, yes, yes, I would. And he handed him the two dollars and started away. And then as an afterthought, he came in and he said, oh, by the way, said Fred, uh, would you tell the whistler that I'm going to the coast for eight weeks? He says, here's sixteen dollars and I'll see him when I get back. John Cosby. He was always a target for a lot of work actors. And uh, he used to carry, I remember, three or four different bundles of money. Well, you know, Cody and I, not much money. 
Bruce when we got a phone call after he'd only thrown about 50 letters and balls and he had to leave in a hurry for some conference with an agent. And for the rest of that week, Fred was complaining about how he hadn't had a chance to work out that week and felt sluggish and <laughs> could not rectify. It was routine and he didn't have a stick with it. One of Fred's pals at the YMCA was Joe DeGray. Who boxed to, uh, oh, I guess, about two years together, two or three times a week. Every once in a while, there'd be a check in the mail for me, a hundred or two hundred dollars. You never knew what it was going to be, even though I never expected anything. It was my pleasure. Be somebody. Another YMCA buddy, Mike Jakes. Fred uh, did uh, call us his stable. And uh, we all liked the idea. We liked the name stable. It, uh, it uh, seemed to bring us uh, so much closer to him. And uh, it's a funny thing, uh, as soon as Fred would hit the West Side YMCA to everybody, and things were quiet there until Fred got in, and everybody seemed to be so enthused uh, when they'd see him come in, because he always had a smile on his face and always something funny to say. Most of the year you'd find Fred either in some radio studio or hunched over a typewriter getting next week's shows ready. But when vacation time came around, Enjoy going to Maine and visiting old friends there. I'm Bill Mullen from Old Rock and Beach, Maine. I've known Fred Allen for over 20 years. I can always remember our golfing at the Arthur Beach Country Club summer. And of course, Fred uh, never played golf because he never did anything he wasn't perfect in. And of course, golf wasn't one of them. But in these golfing outings, Fred would uh, candy for Rear Admiral Fred and Bob White. And uh, one summer, a song was very popular. It's called Doing the What Comes Naturally. And Fred made a verse up to this song that he dedicated to Father White. And I can remember it so well. It goes like this. Father White shoots very tight, tough shots, he won't risk them. When he misses, all he says is down in his full system. Now, last night I came to this country in 1946. And Fred took a tour to say that we came in just for the last act. The glorious last act. James Mason. He was, in a sense, our welcoming committee. He gave us help in our life in New York. He helped us to feel at home in America. But most of all, he made us feel good. He made us feel good in this new country, this new country we live in. He made us love New York. He made us love America. By no point of propaganda, I assure you, he just made us feel at home. An enduring picture of Fred as the American in Paris is recalled by Tallulah Bankhead. When Fred and I worked together for two years on the big show, we were sitting in the rockets above it all of us. And I remember, and I think you probably all know, we had so much nice and 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 I'd always say we're down in the bank town for me. And then we went to one in Paris to do the big show. When we were in Paris, Fred was a great worker. I mean, very well, he took a taxi in a car. And he wanted to find a church. And I asked him if he wanted to give him a lift in my car. And I had a French chauffeur. And he gave me this beautiful church. And he said, I'm out. He said, you think we're going to do a trip to get in there? Mark Green and George Foster. They passed the Paris Peach and came up with Fred and some of the funniest lines I personally have ever heard. He said, that the food in Paris is served in flames. For the first time, the American in Paris enjoys food he can read by. He also had the great lies about the money. He said that, you know, French money is made of ridiculously thin paper. And he said that uh, it was the thinnest paper he ever seen in public. He also had lines like, uh, uh, French money is Kleenex with murals. He said he'd been blowing his nose in it for five days before he found out it was money. Uh, practically nothing was sacred in that respect to Fred, and many people mistook this as uh, bitterness, which it was not at all. It was the man's innate sense of what was comic and what was uh, attackable in any given situation. And this included, incidentally, himself. One of the great classic humorous creations came about when Fred and Tallulah satirized a Mr. and Mrs. Breakfast team.